Good partner, very much to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. All right, well, here I got one more thing to read. Under the Governor's Executive Order Number 5, issued on March 16th, this public meeting is being held via remote participation. Please note the agenda and supporting documents are on the Village's website at www.glenil.org, and then this meeting is called to order. So, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Trustee Gray? Present. Trustee Caprio? Present. Trustee Rogers? Present. Trustee Suisse? Present. Trustee Casmino? Present. Trustee Backel? Present. Mayor Yukish? Present. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Chair? Okay. We're going to go to reports and community. Oops. I need a motion to approve the minutes of September 23rd, 2020 Village Board meeting. I so motion. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? I say it. Motion carries. Number two, is there a motion to approve the amended minutes being processed tonight for October 14th, 2020 Village Board meeting? I so move. Mr. Caprio? Second. Second. Uh, second is Trustee Gray. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Oh, no. We have a roll call. What's all those in favor? All those in favor. Aye. 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 All Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Next reports and communications from mayor and other officers. Uh, I'll start off. Today is, the, is an important that we stop and honor all of our veterans. Due to COVID, we were unable to have our annual veterans luncheon. However, we did deliver 85 care packages to our local vets. A special thank you to our trustees, business, and staff who helped with these special deliveries. And the Veterans Day care packages, they were sponsored by the Village of Homer Glen, Beth Rogers, State Farm Michelle Kerfin, SNL Truck and Equipment Repair, Konos Corn Maze, Costco, Jewel, Homer Glen Foundation, and Homer Township Public Library. Uh, it took a lot of work to get this stuff done, so we want to thank Sue Stylin, Amy Blank, Regina Robinson, and Linda Herdler. And as for the deliveries, we had Village Manager Terry <coughs> Freeling, Trustee Carlo Caprio, Trustee Ruben Pazmino, John and Regina Robinson, Sue Stylin, and myself that went out and delivered them to the uh, veterans that are out there. And it actually, it made me feel very, very good that we were doing what we were doing and I think we should do this more. But uh, it also took me back for one gentleman, the first one I went to and I was hoping it wasn't gonna happen after that. He had told me that he appreciated everything we were doing. He said he's been out of the service since 1975 and this is the first time that anyone has ever done this. And I thought he was going to start crying. And I thought it was just wonderful that this is how sentimental they are about it. And that we did do what we did. So kudos to everybody. I, I think it's absolutely fabulous at what you guys did do. Uh, next, retired flag collection box. Thank you to Trustee Keith Bray for designing and creating the village's new retired collection box, now outside the Village Hall community room entrance. Retired flags may be disposed of properly by placing them in the box. Uh, so, with that, I'm set. We'll go to the trustees and we'll start, try, uh, we'll go with Brock. Trustee Bagel, do you have any reports? Uh, no reports uh, this evening, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Beth, do you have anything for tonight? 
I just want to, um, you know, reiterate how much I appreciate, appreciate Chunky Gray and all of the work that he did to, to get this box together for the veterans. And um, thank you again to staff and everybody that participated in, in helping the vets. Um, it, 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 it means a lot. And I know that this war has, has been great supporting the vets as much as we can, especially during COVID. I think that this is the best thing that we could do. I do miss um, the Kono celebration that we've done in the past. That was, it. I mean, that was amazing, but the responsible thing to do was what you all did today, and I appreciate it. I wish I could have participated, but again, um, I've been traveling a lot, so I'm just trying to be responsible and uh, maintain my social distancing. So hopefully I uh, contributed as much as I could, but again, thank you, Jesse Gray. Uh, it, it just means so much, so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure Trustee Gary is in uh, complete agreement with him because he does do a lot for the village. Uh, are you all set, Beth? Yes. Okay. Then we'll go to Trustee Gray. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't have an official report, but I would uh, like to say thank you to all of you. Um, it certainly fails by comparison. It was uh, something that was needed, and somebody asked me while I was uh, making the box, and I said, you know, there's a lot of people out there who sacrifice a lot more to make sure that that flag flies properly. It's the least I can do to help to retire it. So, um, you know, that was that was definitely something from the heart. I would also like to, uh, uh, in your way, to say thank you to all the veterans out there because, uh, you know, this is a special day for veterans, for our services. Um, I have many family members who are active service and retired. My son-in-law is active service Marine. So thank you to all of those uh, currently serving and, and, uh, and who have served in the past. We do appreciate that. And the last remark I'd like to make is that um, I'd like to just point out that um, you know we're starting to see the new branding showing up. It's showing up right now on our monitors, showing up on our packet pieces, and uh, I think this is looking great. I just wanted to say to staff, you guys are doing a great job on the south one. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Trustee Gray. Trustee Sweet? No report, Mayor. Sweet. Trustee Caprio? No report, Mayor, but I would like to just uh, add to the congratulations to the village and staff for the veterans care packages and all those who contributed. Um, it was very well received. Um, every house I went to was answered by the homeowner and or the spouse. They were extremely uh, uh, you know, grateful for what we had done. Uh, and one gentleman said the same thing to me. He has never gotten anything um, in all of his years. And so he was uh, very pleased with us uh, doing that today. So great job by the entire village. Thank you, Trustee Caprio. Trustee Pasmino. Nothing to report here. Thank you. Uh, go to Village Clerk. Village Attorney. Nothing, Your Honor. Public Safety Officials. Just a quick one, Your Honor. Um, first and foremost, like everybody else has said, thank you to our veterans uh, for all they have done for us. I also want to thank those of you that support our vets, support our service members that are in service now. Thank you to, to the mayor, to the board, to the village staff for all they did for the veterans. Um, as well, I'd like to thank the community for working along with us. Uh, it's getting dark a lot earlier. We've been getting a lot more calls for suspicious activity, and we want to thank the public for their, uh, their information and their, and their help in keeping these streets safe. And that's my report. Thank you. Lieutenant? Next would be Village Manager. Mr. Mayor, I just have a couple of things real quick. Um, I just wanted to point out tonight that we are using our new recently installed cameras that are located now in the Village Hall. Um, we have three of them on the back here, and we have one here. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get better quality for our board meetings and any additional meetings that we end up taking in the future. Um, I also wanted to point out that we are going to be recommending cancellation of the November 24th and the December 23rd board meeting due to the upcoming holidays, which then means that our last meeting um, for the year will be on December 9th for the Village Board. And third, there, uh, we have recently installed today at Galver and 159th Street a mock-up sign of the Village Entry Gateway sign. Um, it's, it's, it's just made out of plywood, so it's not the final um, sign, but it gives us the opportunity to see it in the built environment, and so I encourage everyone to go out and take a look at it before we make the final determination on the sign and everything. That's all I have. Thank you. Where was that at? 
Gallagher and 159th Street? It's a new, it's a new gas station. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next would be public comment. Wayne, you're the only one that signed up for today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's two things I wanted to say tonight. First of all, <coughs> and I guess I'm going to get you uh, emotional too, but uh, I'm one of the veterans that received the care package, and I want to thank the village for the care package because it means a lot to the veterans that, you know, uh, don't get much recognition, especially when came back from Vietnam and consequently you know we really appreciate what uh, the village did today thank you and the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I also want to thank the, the village for putting those muck mats up on um, uh, I can't think of that um, where is it Culver? Culver, yeah, Culver Park, thank you. I take my dog around to all, all the walking areas, and invariably, I'd start walking her, her. I'd get down past the, uh, the parking space, you know, where they, they have the one trash can, and I'd get halfway down my 15 minute, 20 minute down the walk, and she has to go. <laughs> so I finish my walk, you know, I pick up the, obviously I pick up the poop, uh, finish the walk, and then I go all the way back, you know, and I'm carrying this little bag. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all I've got. Thank you. And thank you for your service, too, Wayne. under the consent agenda are considered routine by the village board and will be enacted by one motion. Is there a motion to approve the following items? Consider for approval the accounts payable for the period of October 30th, 2020 through November 12th, 2020 in the amount of $167,135.61. Two, consider for approval payment of the Village of Homer Glen's September legal bills from Mahoney, Silverman & Cross, LLC in the amount of $9,263. Three, consider the approval payments of the 2021 Municipal League Risk Management Association, IMLRMA contribution invoice in the amount of $46,459.39. Consider for approval payment of pay estimate number three from Klaus Brothers, Inc. to the Active Corps Swings Project in the amount of $9,869. Number five, consider the approval of Treasurer's Report of Cash and Investments for the period ending October 30th, 2020. Is there any discussion? And I need a motion. So moved. Trustee Gray. I'll second. Mr. Deco, discussion? Mayor, I'd just like to point out the last item in the time of life is uh, October 31st, 2020, just to clarify that. Okay, nice to be there. Sorry. No, I'm not a problem. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Trustee Gray? Aye. Trustee Deco? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Trustee Suisse? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Pasmino? Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> Legislation and action items. One, acceptance of the village audit for fiscal year ending April 30th, 2020. Is there a motion to authorize the village board to accept and receive the fiscal year ending April 30th, 2020? 20 village audit, and I know we've got to get you to go over it. So we'll do that before they vote on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Good evening. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I'm Ed McCormick. I'm a partner with uh, Mueller and Company, the Auditors, and I've got with me tonight uh, Kevin Bissell, the director with the firm. And actually, Kevin's been the one that's been very much involved in the audit process. So 
I'm actually going to let him do all the, uh, he's already done a lot of the hard work, so let him you know, get the credit for it. But uh, just in real quick summary, the audit went very well. Um, John and his staff did a great job. I think you'll be pleased with the, uh, the results uh, in the report. You know, um, a couple things that you know, Kevin and Felix Hunter will, uh, will point out, but overall, uh, once again, I think it was a real good audit process, and uh, you as a, uh, as a board should be very pleased. But uh, no further ado, I'll let uh, Kevin step up. And Thank you. Um, I believe everyone has a copy of the financial statements for the, uh, for the year. So I'd like to start out um, by going to page uh, Roman numeral 7 uh, of the statements. And that shows the certificate that was awarded for the fiscal year 19 uh, presentation. So I wanted to point that out to everyone. And in talking with John, the current year statements will be submitted uh, for review for a similar award uh, for next year. So. Um, the next thing I wanted to, to go over are pages Roman numeral 10 through 12 of the report. And that's the independent auditor's report. And that's our addition to the financial statements. And that report states that we have audited the financial statements of the village as of April 30th, 2020. It goes on to talk about responsibilities of both management and the auditor. As far as management's responsibilities, Management is responsible for the preparation and the fair presentation of the statements in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. This includes the design and implementation of internal controls related to the preparation and presentation of the statements that are free from material misstatement. As far as our responsibilities as, as auditors, our responsibility is to express opinions on the statements based on our audit. And we conducted our audit in accordance with U.S. generally accepted auditing standards. That requires that we plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. This involves performing procedures to obtain audit evidence about amounts and disclosures in the statements. And the procedures selected depend on our judgment and, and our assessment of risks of material misstatement. And in this process, we can uh, consider internal controls relevant to statement preparation and our assessments. And that's so that we can design appropriate procedures, and, but not to express an opinion on the effectiveness of those controls. In addition, we evaluate the appropriateness of accounting policies, estimates, and the overall presentation of the statements. On page Roman numeral 11, that gives our opinion of the statements. And basically it says, in our opinion, the financial statements of the village are presented fairly in all material respects at April 30th, 2020, in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. The report goes on to mention some other required and, and some other information that is included with the statements, as well as some prior year comparison information. The report also mentions a required report on internal controls over financial reporting and our tests of compliance. That's included with the statements. Now this report describes the scope of our testing and the results of the testing, but it does not uh, provide an opinion on the effectiveness of those controls. I'm going to go ahead and move now to page Roman numeral 13, which is the management's discussion and analysis. The MDNA, as it's called, is unaudited, but it's a very good summary of the year. It explains some of the important inf information in the financial statements. Now some of the financial highlights as you can see, assets and deferred outflows exceeded liabilities and deferred inflows of the village by 64.1 million in April, uh, April 30th of 2020. About 47 million of that is investment in capital assets. And about 7.7 .7 million of that balance is restricted for capital projects and public works. The increase in that position for the year was $2.6 million. Now that increase is down a little bit from the prior year. And the reasons for that are that uh, there were some larger increases in general government expenses and public works uh, expenses as well. On the fund side, the village had a fund balance of $17.5 million at April 30th of 2020. Fund balance decreased by about $4.3 million from the prior year. Now this decrease relates to the early retirement of the 20, uh, 2012 uh, general obligation bonds. And those bonds were retired three years earlier. Page Roman numeral 15 gives a summary of the assets, liabilities, and deferred amounts for both the current and the prior year. 
And as you can see, net position increased approximately $2.6 million. Cash is down a little bit from last year um, due to those additional debt payments, but all liabilities are down as well for, for the same reason. At year end, the village had $9.4 million of unrestricted net position that can be used to, to meet ongoing obligations of the village. Page Roman numeral 16 shows a table um, with details about the, the changes in net position. As you can see, revenues were fairly consistent with prior year. And as I mentioned earlier, general government and public works expenditures were up from, from last year. Page Roman, uh, Roman numeral 18 gives an analysis of the village's funds at April 30th. Um, at April 30th, governmental funds reported ending fund balance of $17.5 million. $4.1 million of that is unassigned and available for ongoing obligations of the village. $8.2 million is restricted or committed for various purposes. And as I mentioned, fund balance decreased $4.3 million. And again, that was related to the additional principal payments that were made on the debt. On page uh, Roman numeral 19, this uh, covers uh, some information about the general fund, which is the village's main operating fund. And it had a surplus of about $750,000 for the year. $720,000 of that was transferred to other funds uh, during the year as well. The motor fuel tax fund increased by almost $400,000. And that was related to a new motor fuel tax revenue that was available uh, this fiscal year. The Park and Recreation Fund increased by almost $600,000 for an ending fund balance of $3.1 million. And the uh, Home Rule Sales Tax Fund showed a deficit at year end, but that was related to the closeout of the Debt Service Fund. Now, the Debt Service Fund was closed near the end of the year upon final payment of the, uh, of the bonds. The Capital Project Fund had a fund balance of $9.2 million at April 30th. $6.8 million of that is restricted. And fund balance on that fund decreased a little bit more than a million dollars in the current year, and that related to spending on capital projects throughout the village. Page Roman numeral 19 also gives some information as far as budgeted expenditures. And I wanted to mention that the general fund expenditures for the year were nearly 340000 less than had been budgeted for, and that's approximately 4%. The reasons for that were there were less general government personnel costs and less public works costs than we were anticipating. Page Roman numeral 20 shows a table of capital assets for the past two years. And as you can see, capital assets are fairly steady from, from year to year. The additions for the year were offset by the depreciation expense uh, uh, that was incurred during the current year. Page Roman numeral 20 also shows a long-term debt table for the current and prior year. And as you can see there, it shows that bonds payable are paid off as of April 30th of 2020. Page Roman numeral 21 discusses some of the upcoming initiatives for the village, um, which, which is good reading and good, good information. So that basically covers the, the MDNA. Um, the statements themselves follow the MDNA, but the MDNA really gives a, a, a good summary of it, so that's why I, I covered that portion of it. I, I would like to go to page 17 of the statements, which is where these footnotes start. And I wanted to point out a couple of the, uh, the more important footnotes for your, uh, for your information. On page 24, you can see that it gives some information about the village's deposits on hand. And you can see that the village's deposits of 580,000 were either fully insured or were collateralized with a letter of credit at April 30th. So, uh, so basically, the, there was not much risk involved with the, uh, the balances on hand. So I wanted to, to point that out. Pages 26 and 27 give some information about the capital assets of the village. I talked a little bit earlier about the capital assets, but that gives a little bit more detail um, by, by type of asset of, of the activity for the year. <coughs> Page 28 shows, uh, again, a, a table of long-term debt, again, in a little bit more detail than was presented earlier. And you can see now that with the bonds being paid off, that the primary liability is now the IMRF pension. Page 29 gives a table of fund balances at April 30th, uh, and it gives some details as to how those are broken out. 
as you can see, the, the village had $17.5 million in total in fund balance at April 30th. 7.7 .7 million uh, is restricted for certain purposes, uh, and those are highways and streets and, and capital projects as well. 5.2 million is assigned, and those are, it's assigned for parks and for capital projects. And 4.3 million is unassigned and it is available for, again, for ongoing operations. The rest of the notes are devoted primarily to the IMRF disclosures that are required. Um, and I did want to point out on pages 37 through 41, um, that gives some information, required information regarding the pension. I wanted to mention that all required payments that are required for IMRF have been made. Um, so I felt that that was important to uh, point out. The remainder of the statements are more detailed schedules of the information presented. Um, comparison to the budget and prior. Uh, pages 48 through 64 is some good statistical schedules that give um, important information in tenure trend. So those are basically the, the financial statements. Um, also wanted to mention pages 65 and 66 are that internal control letter that I mentioned earlier uh, for, for, your, for your review. Um, so, again, that's kind of a summary of the statements. Uh, there's another letter that went along with the audit. Um, before I go to that, I wanted to find out if there were any questions about the statements themselves. Do we have any questions here? So we got a great audit again for this year. <laughs> we do every year. Well, yeah, a lot of hard work goes into that. So I know a lot of work goes into it, and at the end of it, we show that John's done exactly what he's supposed to, and sometimes better than he should. <laughs> so thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question? No, you're not. Um, I have one more letter that I wanted to cover, and that's basically a, a summary of how the audit went. Um, it's the conclusion letter, and this is a required letter, and it's, uh, it points out some significant matters. Um, so I just wanted to cover a, a couple of important topics that, that I felt were, were, were worth mentioning. One of them is that we encountered no difficulties in dealing with management and performing and completing our audit. Uh, attached to that letter are the journal entries that were uh, posted for you know, the year. And those journal entries were uh, reviewed and were approved and posted by management. And we are also pleased to report that there were no disagreements that arose during the course of the audit. As I was saying, I wanted to thank John and the staff for, uh, for getting us the information in a timely and organized manner. Uh, everything was, uh, was, was uh, very well put together. So I wanted to thank John and for that. And that's, that's uh, basically the conclusion of the audit. Any questions on, on that letter? I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to say, to reiterate what you said, to thank staff, thank John and his team, and, uh, and Carrie and, and all of the, uh, the village staff. But I'd also like to thank everybody at the board level, too. You know, we do a, we, we often pass off a victory lap to, to the, those who do, who do all the hard work, but, you know, we do have a great budget here. This is, I know this is dry reading, I've read it, and, and it is, and it's hard to get through, but we do have something really to be proud of here. We have a great village, we have a great financial uh, uh, position, and um, you know that that's a story that's not told often enough. We have no debt, especially given this year. Uh, you know, we had right sized our budget earlier in the year based on you know really good financial input by John and his team and Carrie and her team. And uh, this just bears that out. So you know, we're good financial stewards here. So yes, we are. And I thank everyone for that. Thank you, John, again. Thank you very much. I want to thank Kevin and Ed McCormick. They're they're um, it's a really difficult and. Uh, strenuous process and they make it really uh, as efficient and as, as possible. I really appreciate it. They're really, really good to work with. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jan. We'll see you in another year. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is, I need a motion to approve. I so move. Mr. Caprio. Second. Trustee Pesmino. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Trustee Gray? Aye. Trustee Mackle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Abstain. Trustee Suisse? Aye. Trustee Caprio? 
Aye. Trustee Pesmino. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Number two, is there a motion to approve a donation to the Lockport Fish Food Pantry in the amount of $2,500? I so move. Trustee Suisse. I'll second. Trustee Vehicle. Discussion? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Trustee Casmino? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Suisse? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Trustee Backel? Aye. Trustee Gray? Aye. Motion carries. Number three, is there a motion to approve the proposed holiday shop and dine Homer Glenn Incentive Program in the amount of $25,000? I so move. Trustee Caprio? Second. And Trustee Gray. Is there any discussion? I have a question on uh, the program where it says. Uh, Where it says, uh, okay, for, it's good for purposes made at personal services, shopping, and or dining establishments, but not gas stations. Does that include your Meyer, your Jewel, all your food stores, and for groceries too? Yes, it does under this under the current guidelines. If you guys wanted to change that, that would be a policy decision by the board. But yes, it would be eligible for any of those excluding the gas stations. Well, according to things like, like the Meyer and the, you know, those stores don't need the help. I don't know. Because they're doing so well with groceries. The liquor stores, but, you know, I was just curious. If it includes everything. Okay. If you wanted to exclude the big boxes, we could do that. Obviously, when we go out to purchase the gift certificates, we won't be purchasing from the big boxes. We'll be purchasing them from our local and small businesses. But we, we did leave it. Um, really more for, I think, um, just to encourage uh, as many people to participate in the program as much as possible. But again, that's the prerogative of the Village Board. All right, and the reason we're doing this is the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly, significantly disrupted business activity. To respond to the economic challenges that home Glen businesses are enduring, the village has implemented several initiatives to assist local businesses. The latest proposal, discussed briefly during the CARES Act workshop on October 14th, is an incentive program for shopping and dining local during the holiday season. Residents and non-residents will be encouraged to shop at home or run businesses and submit the receipts to the village. Shoppers have spent over $100 at home or run businesses will be entered into a drawing for $250 in gift cards to home or businesses. The village would purchase the gift cards directly from local businesses, and the proposed amount to be spent on the program is $25,000. So with that, is there any other discussion? And, uh, and I need a motion. Uh, you yeah, have I, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think uh, Trustee Suisse has a very valid point. Um, is there a way that we could sway this so that it impacts more of the small businesses instead of the big box? I was going to concur, that's exactly right, I believe. Big boxes are always open and everybody else is closed. I, I would imagine that's kind of a over here. I, I would make a motion uh, along, along the same lines as uh, Trustee Suisse and Trustee Pazmino that the big box stores be, be exempt from this and we would utilize these gift cards from more of the, the smaller right. local businesses that are certainly hurting. So then what we pretty much need to do is we need to uh, line item because who are we going to not go to and who can they go to? Because right. at the end of the day, I don't want to bring receipts from the places that we shouldn't have been and we say, well, I'm sorry, that doesn't count. So, I mean, but but if, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm understanding uh, Bell's manager correctly, the gift cards can be distributed upon re uh, us, us receiving the receipts. Receipts can be from anywhere, basically, right? Except for, I think you said gas. Um, but the cards that you're going to buy will not be from the from the big boxes. They will be from the local stores and the local uh, merchants, so the smaller ones, presumably. So you, while you can walk in with the $100 worth of Menards 
receipts to be eligible for the program, the card we would receive would be for not for Menards or for a Home Depot, it would only be for the other small so, local uh, shops. So the $25,000 would be spent buying those so. gift cards. Oh. So, so, so if you walked in with $100 with the Home Depot or Menards or Meyer or something, you'd still be eligible for the uh, program. But the card that you would receive from the village, you'd have a choice, I assume, but those would be bought from the smaller, uh, more local, more not, I, I, I hate using the word small because I'm not being pejorative at all, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that these are more of the local um, businesses, so. I, I, think it's, I, I think it's a good idea. I think it's because it does encourage people to continue to shop in the village, be it in a big box, because we still do get tax revenue from that, and we need that. But it also helps to, to convert some of that activity into activity at some of the more local and more non-regional, non-chain type places. So. Yeah, I guess I would concur with that in the sense that when you say big box, we all think of the the buyers, the people's and the cards. But Ace is a large company, but it's locally owned. Um, yeah, so we would, if you wanted to um, define big boxes, we would use the same definition that we did when we were doing some of the other assistance programs, like for the grants where if they were over a certain threshold in terms of sales, they were ineligible, and that would, that would kick out Myers, it would kick out um, Home Depot, Jewel, um, Menards. Menards. But Ace would, would still under that threshold, so they would still be. I just use that as yeah. an example, yeah. because I'm not yeah. sure that business. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that on here. Uh, purchase of gift cards at big box stores are not eligible. Just because me and them said, Yes, it does. I, I, did, I, I must say I was no, talking about when you first started, so I didn't catch your first part of it. Is that good? Very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah I think this is a good program. <clears throat> Hopefully people will participate. I mean, we've been encouraging people now for nine months to shop locally. We've been doing it for years, really had a focus on it for the last nine months, so hopefully this just, you know, uh, really drives that point home. Yeah, I think this is a great, thoughtful program. And it will help the small business. Okay, any other discussion? Well, I just wanted to bring up, though, which is a good thing, too. It applies to residents and non-residents shopping in the village, so that's, that's great. Yeah, because either way, they're going to come back and spend it here. So we're not making any changes to this program? Well, no, if, if we already know that it's not going to, as for being purchased, the big boxes will be out, and then the rest of it will go to okay. restaurants, liquor store. Yeah. So much. Uh, okay, so. That's right. Not just that. No. Oh, not just that, but it is she. See if she wants to be here. Beth, do you want to say something? No, I, 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 did, I did, but um, I would just concur with what Trustee Gray said. I, I, I was going to say what he said, but he said, I, I agree with what he's saying. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Trustee Bagel? Aye. Trustee Suisse? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye, I'm sorry, I'm trying to mute it so that you know you don't hear any background noise, but aye. Trustee Gray? Aye. Trustee Pasmino? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Motion carries. Next, approval to lease the vacant property on the corner of 151st Street, Green Road. The vacant property is located at the corner of 151st Street and Cream Road is currently under lease by the Homer Township Road District. The lease will end December 31st, 2020 and will not be renewed. The village has used this property for additional parking for the Homer Community Festival and most recently for a drive-in movie. The property at 151st and Cream Road will provide much needed additional parking for the Homer Community Festival and other events as witnessed at the 2019 Trump Retreat and Homer for the holiday events. Additional overflow parking is needed when the village has a large event turnout. Attendees of these large events will often seek parking at the Homer Township Library, the adjacent Homer Township Administration and Sports Parking Lots, and the neighboring subdivisions. The lease property would provide the much needed additional parking for Homer Community Festival and other events. In addition to events, the vacant lot may be served for events while Heritage Park is under construction. So, I need a motion. I so move. Trustee 
Camp again? I'll second. Echo. Any discussion? Just a little background that we, we have continued to use this slot for several years as I've been on the festival committee and chair of it. Um, we have used it for overflow for many other events. Um, it will come in handy when the park is under construction. All the things you said. Um, we are paying basically the taxes on the lot with this $435 a month. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's gone up a little bit over the years. Um, I think the year we started for the uh, highway park and started to raise originally at three fifty dollars or somewhere in that range, and it's gone up uh, very little each, uh, each year thereafter. Um, we do have to um, agree that one item, which is in the lease, that if the property sells and the new owner does not want us to leave that lease out any longer, then we have to give up that right to lease that property. But other than that, we would like to at some point consider purchasing that property as it would be in line uh, with everything else we've got going on 151st, but at this point in time, the purchase price of that property is uh, a little out of the ballpark. Uh, but with all respect, I, uh, the owner uh, has been very gracious to us, and uh, the highway department's done a great job of keeping that property up, so. And I think it's great that we do it because Otherwise, if we end up parking down in Bankston's, which they don't charge, but then now we're paying for buses to go back and forth. So this way, people are nice and close enough to worry about waiting for a bus to come get them. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call? Trustee Sweets? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Gray? Aye. Trustee Babble? Aye. Trustee Pasvino? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve a proposal for these three B3 engineering services to prepare a phase one study for the west extension of the Harrow's Trail in the amount of $24,877.69? As the board knows, the village continues to seek expansion of the village's Harrow's Trail system. One such trail extension would expand the western limits of the Harrow's Trail to Coachman Lane in the Saddlebrook subdivision. The potential extension of the Heroes Trail will allow residents to access Heritage Park from the recently completed trail connection to Coachman Lane. The proposed extension is shown on the attached aerial as a dashed blue line. To pay for the proposed trail extension, the village would seek to obtain grant funding such as CMAQ funds same funding used for the previous trails constructed in the village. In order to qualify for the grant funding opportunities, a phase one study must be completed and approved by IDOT prior to any grant applications being submitted. The phase one study provides preliminary engineering and environmental review for the proposed project, such as a trail extension. The village obtained a proposal from B3 Engineering for the preparation of the phase one study for the proposed west extension of the Harris Trail. B3 engineering is included in the village's recent board approved engineering firm list and as needed engineer, engineering services. <clears throat> the proposed cost by B3 engineering to complete the phase one study is $24,877.69. So I need a motion. So moved. I'll second. Uh, Mayor, this this uh, uh, Mayor? Um, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I think this is great. I just want to encourage staff, and I know y'all have been really good about it, but just to keep the Park and Rec Committee in the loop on this because you know we do try to um, make sure that we're on top of it. Trails as part of our committee, we want to be involved in it as much as possible. So just to keep us in the loop on it. We can do that. We had, uh, uh, this came before the, the Public Safety uh, Committee last week. We had an extensive conversation uh, regarding this, and um, we pretty much tried to cover every angle here, and, and I believe it passed unanimously, so I just wanted to pass that along. I have a question for uh, Director Salamovich. Um, to the west of Coachman's Lane, is that a private lot or is that continue of the uh, continuation of the combat um, right away? The combat right away continues. It, it goes uh, quite quite uh, a distance. It goes past the, 
don't recall the school name uh, down there. And then it actually, when it gets close to Mile Road, it actually turns, goes north, and then kind of heads towards 355. So th there is kind of an extensive uh, kind of right away going through there. And would that be considered for future phases? I know that you probably don't have a crystal ball that I'm asking you for, but I mean, we would continue to serve. You know, if you look at the way this is right now, once you get past, um, once you get past Saddlebrook Lane, um, you're around the street if you if you didn't build the path. So it only makes sense to build that path from Saddlebrook Lane to Coachman's if you're going to continue on. Yeah, at some point down the road, I believe as part of the, the master trails plan, there there is, uh, I know in the past with, we had a, a separate trails committee, this was discussed, um, to extend it all the way down to eventually to 355 where uh, the Forest Preserve District is going to be constructing uh, what is called Beverly's Memorial Trail System, which is in, within the 355 corridor. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Suiz? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Casmino? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Trustee Baffle? Aye. Trustee Gray? Aye. Motion carries. Accepting a bid proposal from Austin Tyler Construction Inc. to complete drainage work for the 2020 drainage improvement program within the village of Homer Glen. Upon incorporation of the village of Homer Glen in April of 2001, the village inherited a large number of drainage issues throughout the community. In order to effectively manage these drainage issues, the staff compiled a list of the issues currently include over 50 drainage issues, small to large, and has ranked these drainage issues according to various criteria. The village has been working to address four drainage products, projects as part of the 2019 Drainage Improvement Program. These four projects were identified on the village's master drainage list and are located in the Meadowcrest, Stafford Ridge Estates, Country Woods, and Chickasaw Hills 6th, 6th edition subdivisions. The Country Woods project has been completed. The Stadler Ridge project is currently under construction and due to the complexity of the drainage issues, the Metacrest project is still in design phase. Engineering for the Chickasaw Hills 6th edition project has been completed and has been combined with the completed engineering plans for the drainage project on Eagle Ridge Drive in the Woodbine Estate subdivision as part of the 2020 Drainage Improvement Program. I would need... I so move. Okay, Caprio. Second. Trustee Gray, discussion. Well, the only thing that I didn't say on it is uh, the price of this is $677,777.55. So is there any concerns, any complaints, any issues? No, also that it covers many, many areas of the building for drainage issues, and I think it's a project well deserved. And project that's going to make a lot of people happy at the end of the day. Yes, it will. So, is there a motion? We are here to the motion. Is there any other discussion? Madam Clerk, please kindly vote. Trustee Gray? Aye. Trustee Backel? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Trustee Swiss? Aye. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Casmino? Aye. Motion carries. Number seven, accepting either 3,000K, 2,200K, or PC Amber LED Street as a standard color of the street lights within the village of Palmer Glen as measured in degrees Kelvin. So the village is responsible for the proper operation and maintenance of street lights within the village. To accomplish this task, the village is contracted to the Lions Pinner Electric Company 
to maintain the street lights. In mid-2019, staff attended a seminar offered by ComEd regarding their energy efficiency program. This program provides technical assistance and incentives to partially offset energy efficiency improvement costs. Public sector offerings provide for common improvements such as LED lighting upgrades, heating and cooling systems, and more. To take advantage of the energy efficiency program, village staff is seeking to upgrade municipal owned street lighting, and the goal of this program is to upgrade the existing street lights within the village. From the existing high pressure sodium lights to light emanating dioxide, LED street lights. During the preparation of the workshop presentation to the village board, staff met with Trustee Sweet and other members of the Environmental Committee to discuss the street light upgrade program. The Environmental Committee is concerned about the color of the street lights that they would install along Heritage Circle and the future street light replacements throughout the village. As compared to the color of the existing HPS street lights, the color of the street lights along Heritage Circle is 3000K as measured in degrees Kelvin. The typical color of the HPS lights is approximately 2200K. Is there a motion? I so move. Just be careful now. Second. Just be careful now. Discussion? Yes, Mayor. Well, I just, I just wanted to know what, what's the motion for? 3,200 or PCM? Are we, are we to choose right now? Or? Yes. So, did you have a preference on, on the motion? Yeah, my motion would be to approve the, as the Public Services and Safety Committee also uh, sent the recommendation to the board to 3,000K that is currently installed within the park limits of uh, the, the uh, ring road and uh, that was the motion. I would not go that way. I would not say, I think everybody has to have the discussion before you automatically say 3,000K, boom. Um, I think I think it has to be a discussion first, and then we go back and consider the motion for whatever level things there, you know, whatever level you want. Because um, I was at public service in safety committee meeting. Other than uh, Mr. Selmovich and Mr. Robinson in the two chairs, nobody said a word. And some of the comments were very personal in matter, so I did not say a lot of, I would not put a lot of credit into their recommendation for 3,000 k So, with that being said, I think I have a statement that we sent out to every to the board, and for the record, I would like to read that statement um, because we did not have a form at our last EC meeting, so. We were not able to get a formal recommendation at that moment because that meeting took place last week, October 28th or something like that. But for the record, I'd like to read this before we go on with deciding what you're going to do without hearing any background or any history. Okay. The statement from the Environment Committee, putting up the test lights has made this. Putting up the test lights has been very helpful with converting to LEDs and to removing the unshielded 14-inch drop lenses in order to get to an equivalent color of HPS without a harmful and polluting white light. There were a couple of exceptions which in our committee which, choose, which chose 2200K LED, but the majority of the Environment Committee members concurred that a PC Amber LED is the closest equivalent to our 70 watt HPF street lights that we have and should be the standard used for Homer Glen street lighting as it is in accordance with the street lighting paragraph in the ordinance. The spectrum of poor outdoor lighting influences and causes many negative aspects of light pollution, glare, and additional sky glow from human health to animal life and biological processes. The idea of incorporating white LEDs and changing from HPS lamps saves less energy than what is being touted. The white LEDs without using PC amber LEDs dramatically increases light pollution and harmful effects per scientific evidence. To the eye, the 2200K CCT correlated color temperature appears whiter than HPS. 
In terms of dark sky impacts, it will have about 40 to 50 percent greater sky glow than HPS and about twice the sky glow impacts of a good PC Amber LED. The Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition, along with Dark Sky Partners, states that white LEDs, e.g., the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society recommended 3,000 K LEDs have lumen for lumen sky glow impacts three times greater than good PC Amber LEDs. <coughs> Homer Glenn's advisor, who is well known throughout the world as an expert because of his studies of glare and light pollution, recommends PC Amber LEDs for Homer Glenn. To prevent degrading our skies, we must keep our standards higher. We need to be a leader in this idea, you know, we need to be a leader and not just accept what IDA says is okay at 3,000K. But that, that, um, uh, we must keep our standards higher was the end of the EC statement. So the part about not accepting IDA, was that part of the EC statement or that was your... I didn't say he, they didn't accept IDA. They, I'm just, I read the no, EC oh, no, I was yeah. asking where the EC statement ended. Did the, uh, there, you just mentioned the line that said we should not accept what IDA says about 3,000K. No, that was just my... That was your... Yeah, that's why I said... Uh, the statements <coughs> Right, I, I just, in backtracking, I, I'd just like to address that part of it. Um, why, do we, why do we belong to IDA and why do we pay dues to them every year? We've used them since the Dark Skies Initiative has become um, a, a thing in Homer Glen. We've always pointed to International Dark Sky Association as our subject matter experts. We belong to their um, their membership, their uh, whatever you call it, their, their group. We, we pay dues to belong to them and we use them. They say, International Dark Sky Association says, that these lamps will conform to our International Dark Sky Community um, standing. They say that the fixture, um, I'm not 100% certain if it's on their fixture seal of approval list, but my understanding is that if it isn't already, it's in the process of being um, investigated to be included on that, and it, it, that fixture itself also is uh, recommended by Christian Lugenbuehl, is that how you say his name? I'm sorry, Mr. Lugenbuehl, um, as, as the preferred uh, fixture. Um, there seems to be some difference between the additional sky glow, the additional um, output of these lights between International Dark, Dark, the International Dark Sky Coalition, Dark Sky Partners, and the International Dark Sky Association. We have always pointed to the International Dark Sky Association. They have sanctioned these lights. We have used these lights out on Heritage Circle. To my knowledge, I believe those are about two years now they've been out there, we've not had one complaint about those lights. We had, um, recently, we've started to see some new development in the village in the way of the square of Goodings Grove, the townhouses uh, subdivision that is being built up there, which is a great thing to see because we've not had a newly planted subdivision in the village for you know, 12 or more years. They specifically stood at that podium and told us that when it came to the lighting for their streets, which will, they will not be dedicated streets, but they wanted to make sure that they got the lighting right, they said they pointed to the lights that we had installed out on Heritage Circle and they said they understood how strict our rules were and how cumbersome some of the mathematics and the equations can get. So they were, they were happy to have a standard that they could point to and say, you've used this, we're going to use this so we know we'll be compliant. I feel, for me, I don't personally like the PC Amber. I have investigated these lights in these places. Um, I don't think there's enough difference between the 2200 and the 3000 to warrant for going the ComEd grant money that is out there. ComEd will not reimburse us for anything we spend on 2200K lights. They will reimburse us on the 3000, the International Dark Sky Association sanctioned 3000 Kelvin lights. Um, I also like the fact that by having a standard finally that the developers can point to and say, we understand now what Home Plan wants. This is it. Give them this and we'll be okay. If we change this right now, we're going to have, you know, and again, I know this isn't the Environment Committee's outlook, and it's not necessarily Public Safety and Services outlook, but it is the Development Outlook. And the Development Outlook is going to have developers looking at us going, 
There they go again. They can't seem to stick to their own standards. They change them all the time. How are we supposed to do business in this town? So I, I like the fact that we now have a standard that people can point to. Um, well, you had a standard before, too. You know, what you're doing is you're going against the ordinance where the paragraph, there's a complete paragraph just on street lights. And that paragraph, I'll read it again, any luminaire used for street lighting shall be fully shielded 71 HPS or lamp equivalent to HPS in CCT as measured in degrees Kelvin. So that is your standard. What we have in the end, according to advisors, according to people, a 3000K LED is not the equivalent 3000K in a other fixture. Because you could, you could actually see the, here I'll show you the, I mean, 3000K is all, they're white. They're all sorts of white compared to what we have out there. I know at public safety, they said, oh, they look like heat lamps. Oh, they look this way. You can't let personal opinions, you can't allow personal opinions to reign, reign over this. Yes. I, I, I want to know, because this was some time ago when I said, did you, did everybody, did all the trustees look at uh, both places? I, I, yes. Okay. And, and some time ago, I said, you have to take a look what it looks like in a regular neighborhood and go on Stone Oak Way. Did you do that? Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Yes. Did you do that? And, and then you went to the corner of Boulder and Apple Way, and what was your thoughts? I, How did those colors look to your eyes? How I, think, I think the PC numbers are way too dim. The 2200 okay. doesn't significantly. I'm talking change. about what's over on in a regular neighborhood and not what you see in the park. Uh, no, no, no I. I you said, so Pebble Creek, Stone Oak Way. Oh, I did not go there. Did you go to Pebble Creek? I did. And, and again, I, what you're saying is, is you know, that we shouldn't have a, a personal opinion on this, and I think this is going to probably affect everybody personally anyhow, so I think that's kind of a moot point. But, you know, Trustee Sweets and I have had many discussions about lighting over the years. Um, many of them very productive. I think we always see each other's ways. And we both did agree recently that we've had some lighting issues in the, in the village that were bad. You know, just recently we've had one developer come uh, go, go beyond the limits and they were reined back in. It was brought back into line with what the village standards are. And I told you at the time, I didn't like that lighting. I thought that was way over the top. It was way too harsh. It didn't, it was not additive. To me, lighting should always be additive. It should bring something to the game. It should not just be there like you, you and the Environment Committee and the International Dark Sky Association, all of them, have said that it shouldn't be a race to just get bigger, brighter, and better. It should be, to me, Lighting is aesthetic, lighting is safety, but it should also be, it, it has to work with us. I think the 3,000 cases that are out on Heritage Park or Heritage Circle right now, I think they work. I think they work also when you can see right next door in, this, in the township uh, sports complex, they have, I don't even know what it is, I think they're trying to light up the entire town from those things some nights. <laughs> so when you see the balance between those, and I live in the subdivision right next door, there's no glow from that, but I can tell you in the in the fall, when the football's going on, uh, that's all I can see, or baseball too, is the township lights. You never see any effect from what's happening in, the, in uh, Herod, uh, Heritage Circle. So, like I said, I think that I think the PC Amber ones are way too, and by the way, I did go through uh, Cedar Brook. The one, the first time I went through Cedar Brook, it happened to be a foggy night, which was an even more bizarre thing because, you know, it kind of like made these bubbles of light. And they are so dim, for starters, they barely reached the ground, and then it was very orange and kind of almost eerie. So I just didn't like those. And like I said, the 2200, I just don't think there's enough of a difference between the two, between the 3000. You know, if, if at some future point, if we, if we do approve the 3000 tonight, if some future point, if ComEd says they want to expand their program to either go down in their scales, then we can look at saying, hey, do we want to open up a range now? But for right now, I think 3,000 is very good. I think going too low is also not going to serve as well as far as the safety issues go. Um, but right now, I think that I think 3,000 is a, a good um, a good place to start. And as far as the, the the fact that IDA sanctions these lights, 
That to me says a lot. Yeah, so let me please speak on behalf of public services and safety because I don't believe either chair, myself or Brock, were rude or demeaning to you at all. I was really a personal preference thing for me. It was a safety thing for me. The lights in my subdivision are semi low. They're not quite the DC number. They're somewhere in between that and 2200. You can't even see the kids down the street, even when driving. It's a, it's a very sensitive issue for me from a safety perspective. The lights that are on the ring road, Heritage Circle, they are very directional. Uh, they are movable in that direction. They do not bleed out in that fixture. Uh, they are dimmable. Um, so there's a lot of bonuses and benefits to those lights. I have not heard, again, I trust me, Gary stole most of my thunder. We have developers who are, are happy that we have, or we have a developer. We're going to finally maybe set a lot of standard, maybe not. HPS lamps are going to be extinct at some point. Uh, dark skies are already approved to 3,000 K. Uh, the kind of rebate, that's $20,000, if I'm not mistaken, in rebates that we could gain from going to the 3,000K. We go to the 2,200, we throw $20,000 out the window. Hey, to me, those are a lot of reasons why, and the fact that nobody in either side of the subdivision or the three sides of the subdivisions have complained about the lighting in the current park. I, I think they're ample. I do agree with the trusted speech when you said putting those lamps next to each other sort of tells a different story because you, you go from light to dark. Mm -hmm. um, and, and but if you look at the color photos of how it looks on a basketball net and things of that nature, you know, they're not these aren't facing forward, these are facing downward. Um, I just it's a it's a personal preference and a safety thing for me. You know, I, I agree that environmentally we have the sound in many areas. You know, you see commercials today, all the plastic that's being used nowadays for COVID. Let's worry about plastic more so than lighting. <laughs> Well, I would I would just I, I'd just like to say a couple things. One is I've had two points to make. One is I do take great pride in, in the fact that we're a dark sky community. I know there's not a lot of dark sky communities in the, even in the, the entire country. So I take great pride. In, in matter of fact, um, my my wife and I were coming home from the airport, and the uh, uh, the, the Uber driver was made the comment. He goes, "Well, it was, it's dark coming in here." I said. Well, we're a dark sky community as, as he's driving through the subdivision. And, I, and I, I take pride in it. And I've also been very dark sky friendly. And when Bell Tower uh, put up the lights, the, the property manager there redid all the lights at Bell Tower. I was, I was the chairman of the uh, planning commission at the time. And I received all sorts of uh, information from the environmental committee. And I, but I, I didn't need it because I already knew I took a drive over there and I contacted everybody on the planning commission, all of my commissioners. I said, I want you to go take a look over. I didn't, I didn't sway them as to what they should do. Go over there, I'd just like to go take a look at this because it's going to be an agenda item in the next month. And every one of them at the, at the meeting uh, was on the same page. And I, and I made sure that this manager at the Bell Tower property conformed to the Dark Sky Ordinance. And it was an, uh, a, it was an expense for him to do that. But that was his, that was his problem. He went ahead and put those lights in without contacting us and letting us know that he was doing, you know, it was one of those situations where he thought it'd be better to, to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. We made, we made sure that he changed those bags at his cost. So, you know, I'm, I'm extremely friendly with the, the dark sky. And, you know, it's 3000 K is the requirement to become a dark sky. We meet those requirements. I don't see an issue with that. Well, I think our standards need to be better. You know, just because IDA says that's good enough, I think we need to be the leader. We need to do more. And, the, you know, just going back to another comment I want to make, and uh, ComEd and Design Lights Consortium are still oversimplifying the environmental dimensions of outdoor lighting by focusing on one factor, energy consumption. They are completely ignoring other important environmental impacts that are made worse by white LEDs, like I said, these sky glow, ecological and potential human health impacts. It, it, it's got to be a balancing act between your money and energy savings and the environmental impact of what's this going to do to us. Plus, why, why is this being rushed through on this voting today without even the board knowing more, getting more information, getting, uh, why is this being rushed through today? Why does it have to be done today? 
Well, let, let, me ask, let me ask this question. Um, how many dark sky communities are there in the, in the, in the state? In the state? How many? That's in the country. Okay. So, so you're saying there's not many in the state? We're the only one in the state? Oh, no. There's more than, there's more than us. There's a lot in the So, especially over the coast. Okay, no, no, but, but I'm, talking about, I'm talking about in the state of Illinois. How many are in the state of Illinois? I believe there's three. Well, I, I, would, I would argue if there's only three, that I would argue that as far as being a leader, I think we are a leader. Mm -hmm. Seriously. If, if you were to tell me there was 4,000, I would say, no, we're not a leader. When there's three, I would say we are a leader. Yeah, there's two down the state, I'm pretty sure. And there is no rush to get this done other than one thing, or two things. We want to set a standard. We become friendly to setting the standard almost. And we have until December 1st to file for the comment grants, if I'm not mistaken, um, to obtain that $20,000 rebate. We don't do it by then. I, it's fine if we want to throw $20,000 away and just extend this for a few more days. Okay. Well, can I well, add one well we have a standard that says 3000 k right, right now in our, in our book. Yeah. And we're, we're debating how we're interpreting what CCT means, because I can pull up IDA specs and say 3,000 Kelvin uh, uh, CCT is, is sanctioned. So we're debating that right now. That's the standard we're trying to get to. The only thing else I would like to point out in, tar tar in addressing Trustee Sweet's concern about timing is that um, we have received notice from our contractors that the current streetlights that we have in the village well, no, that those fixtures are no longer going to be manufactured starting next year, and we get we we have replacements throughout the year that do require these to be replaced, and it's important that we get clear direction from the board on what that standard is going to be. And that's the HPS lamps that I referred to. Yes, they're going to be extinct. Yes. Well, it's not like they're going to fall out of the sky. They already have. Oh, pressure riders, as we like to speak. Yeah, they are going to call. Uh, Trustee Rogers, do you want to speak? I did. Um, first, I want to say I, I think that uh, Trustee Gray did a great job in researching this and his due diligence on this. Is, it, it really is spot on. Um, I agree with everything that he's saying. I will always, as former chairman of the Public Safety Committee, I will always lean towards um, Trustee Caprio and Trustee Brock as chairman of those committees now, I support our police officers. They believe that 3,000 is worth. And in, in today's time, I, I just feel like <clears throat> that they're right, that 3,000 K is, is definitely the way to stay. Um, I would like to, before I believe um, Mr. Lugaville is on the phone, and if we can uh, see if he wants to make a comment before we do that. Um, going back to this December date, what are you talking about? December 3rd, what are you talking about? Comment that grant deadline? Yeah, Top, Top Ed has their, their energy efficiency program. They're offering actually an additional 25% on top of the existing um, grant opportunity. So the deadline is, I believe it's December 3rd that we have to have our final application in, but before you can do a final application, you do have to do a pre-application first. When is that due? Uh, I'm assuming that it's going to take about two weeks to get the pre-application in and complete it and get that approved before we can get the final. So if you kind of go backwards, then you know we're getting towards uh, kind of the, the mid-November uh, time frame. Um, and in addition, uh, our lighting contractor, Lions Pinner, had mentioned that Actually, the, the 70 watt high pressure sodiums, which is the, the fixtures that we would be typically using in the subdivisions, is no longer available. And that was the letter that was included from GE that they're no longer making it. So we actually have a light right now that um, was damaged uh, by lightning that uh, we're waiting to determine um, which direction we need to go as far as what light source, light color, so that we can actually replace that light as well, too. Well, I'd like to make a comment. So if it's something regarding this 25% bonus of the application, whatever, so unless something has changed since 3 o'clock this afternoon, 
a final application, yes, that has to be done by the beginning of December, but that means you're, you, what you're getting that bonus for, those lights have to be installed. It's not just a piece of paper flying across somebody's desk. So that is not true information. I believe the, the application, because you have to get everything pre-approved from ComEd before you can even order the lights. Well, you know Mary Jo. From the, she's in charge of this whole incentive program. I talked to her at the beginning of the year, and I talked to her again at 3 o'clock, and I asked her, what's with this bonus of 25% that has to be done? She said, yes, the final application has to be done by the first week in December, but that means all your materials have to be installed and in working order. If, and that's and that's for her, and she also said, this same program is going to continue to 2021. And the, the lighting program, most likely, I mean, they, they have been kind of rotating it uh, through the years there. Um, but again, in order, before you can actually order anything, and there, there are stipulations, before you can even order your equipment and your, or your materials, you have to get everything approved, so. Right, but it's not going to get, you're not going to get a 20-some percent bonus by having an application in by the beginning of December because you have no materials and you don't have any working lights. You don't have that installed. And that was, I asked her twice to verify that because I've been getting different information from staff. So we will we'll verify that, that information. That's not the same information that we're receiving. So I don't know this lady. So I've never communicated with this lady who Trustee Sweet's talking about. I guess I just want to summarize a couple of points. Is you know we've started this process. Um, I think about the beginning of the year. I think was when we. It was, it was actually. Was it in 2019? Almost, it was almost probably mid 2019. Okay. So, and at that time, we were trying to get going on the Comet Energy Efficiency Program as well. And at that time, you guys remanded it back to the Environmental Committee to take a look at this and to make some recommendations and do some additional research. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, um, that sl slowed things down quite a bit, which is why we're sitting here tonight, because we were trying to get these test lights um, in conjunction with working with the environmental committee so that you guys could see each one of these lights in the built environment. Not just out here behind the park, but in a neighborhood as well, which is why we put them in, in, um, down the street. So at this point, I think that what I'm asking for is we do need clear direction from the board on what your policy decision is going to be because we need to make sure that we're following it and we're consistently following those things. And I don't know what else we could possibly bring to the table other than what we've already brought in terms of the actual lights being installed here, which didn't cost the village anything. Obviously, they were delayed because the manufacturers shut down because of COVID. But you've seen them in the built environment now. You know what they look like. So um, those are kind of just some of the summary points I wanted to share with the board from the staff perspective. Can we please see if Mr. Luganville would like to make a comment yes. or if he wants, needs to answer any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Luganville. You should be able to speak now if you have news. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make comments. Um, I. There's been a lot of information discussed in the last 10 or 15 minutes, and I have to say that the audio is a little difficult to understand, so I uh, won't be able to address everybody, and I don't know the names, so I apologize for, uh, except for a few of you, I don't know most of your names, so I apologize, it'll be kind of generic. I would like to be able to address you directly, but I won't be able to. Um, I am not a spokesperson for IDA. I was formerly on the board of IDA, I was in fact the uh, person who originally proposed the creation of the Dark Sky Community Program in 2001. So I am familiar with it, but I, again, am not a spokesman for IDA. I want to clarify a little bit, though, my understanding of what IDA means when they say a light, a light meets their, their recommendations for Dark Sky Communities. The 3,000 Kelvin light, which I want to point out, is formerly on their website and no longer on their website. But when they had the number 3,000, that was intended as the minimum standard to meet their recommendations for dark sky quality. 
So keep that in mind. That is not, uh, you shouldn't take that as a gold star or this is what IDA wants. That was the minimum standard. IDA, even when they had that standard on their website, had it clearly stated that 3,000 K, K or, or lower impact work was what their recommendation was. That's number one. Number two, that document, which used to say that about 3,000 K or less, has been removed from the IDA website. I went looking for it yesterday, and it is no longer there. I had a link to it in my web documents, and that link uh, was broken, and I had to dig around the website before I could find it and had removed it. I understand that the reason they have removed it is because the IDA technical committee that I am familiar with, though I'm still not speaking for IDA or the technical committee, is rediscussing the way they word their recommendations to try to resolve this ambiguity which you are grappling with right now. This lack of clarity, I should say, about what is better for dark skies and what their standards are. So I hope that helps clarify. Uh, it would be helpful uh, if I suppose if this is really a great concern that we have IDA speaking here rather than myself or IDA. But I think that's a good understand, uh, a reliable understanding of what IDA's requirements are. Um, IDA, by the way, also would support, if you ask them about the PC Amber or the 2200 Kelvin, all of which are lower impact than the 3000 Kelvin standard that you are considering, all are recommended by IDA, all supported by IDA. Number two, or number three, those, the impacts on the dark skies of these other lights, 2200 Kelvin or PC Amber, are unambiguously better for dark skies. IDA does not dispute that. Uh, you, somebody in the discussion said there was some disagreement. Um, I don't believe there is any disagreement among dark sky scientists or the, uh, uh, the, the research that makes it clear that these uh, yellower lights are lower impact. If there is a concern about brightness levels, in other words, if you feel that the light looks too dim, that's a separate measure of the light. That is not related to the spectrum. That is related to the amount of wattage or the number of lumens you have. And that is, I understand, not under discussion at this point. We are trying to discuss what spectrum is the best for uh, projecting dark sky. There has been a lot of discussion about what is the requirement of the Homer Glenn uh, lighting code. The lighting code, when you have ambiguous or contradictory or unclear terminology, as I think we are uh, uh, encountering here in the discussion about what might be the equivalent if an LED is used instead of your former 75 or 70 watt high pressure sodium, there is no question some ambiguity in the wording on the, on the, uh, in the ordinance. I want to pause briefly and ask if my audio is coming through without too much breaking up. It's coming through fine. Thank you. I have a poor internet connection, so sometimes my uh, audio is poor. So, the, uh, um, the, the ambiguity, when you have ambiguity or confusion in uh, the wording of a code, to me it always helps to go back and look at the purpose that was expressed by the community when it adopted, when it adopted the ordinance. And this is in a large attestation section at the top of your ordinance. It's not included in the line code, but the attestation section actually lays out what the, what the village was trying to do when it adopted its code. And when I read that section, it's made clear that the purpose in uh, adopting your writing code was for protecting dark skies first and foremost. So if we are confused about when we look for what the equivalent regarding dark skies is, should it be 3,000 Kelvin or should it be some other spectrum? Uh, I think the, the, uh, the amount of impact on dark skies ought to be a very fine consideration for the, for the board to look at. And I don't think that's ambiguous when I read that section of the, uh, that section of your ordinance, the document ordinance. Uh, it's not for me, of course, I don't mean to presume to interpret what the purpose of the village is. I'm only looking at the documents that were uh, considered when the board reviewed and adopted the ordinance back in, I think, 2007. Uh, finally, uh, a comment was made about leadership. Uh, I know it was raised by a, a raise and responded to by a couple of the trustees. Uh, and the point was made that there are other dark sky communities in Illinois, and I think actually there is one other 
in uh, Illinois, if, if, the, if the group is concerned, interested in that. I believe the other one is uh, Hawthorne Woods. I don't think there are three, but in any case, uh, the comment was made that you are leading because there are only two of you in the state. And I wonder, uh, there's another way of comparing, deciding, establishing your leadership role, and rather than if the one might be to compare to all the hundreds or thousands of other municipalities or communities around the state which do not have lighting ordinances at all and have not, as far as I know, expressed any interest in protecting their dark sky. You can compare to those and say you are leading with respect to those and that is absolutely a valid comparison. But if you want to compare to whether you're leading in dark sky itself rather than leading amongst the group of people or entities that aren't concerned about dark skies, you might look at the other dark sky communities and look at which ones are doing better. Uh, and rather than meeting the minimum standard, I think it might be considered a valid way of considering whether you're leading or not, is whether you're doing better than the minimum standards and whether you're doing better than, uh, as, well, as well as you can within the other needs that you have for the community in terms of safety and utility. Uh, that's really, I think, all the points I want to make. I'm certainly glad to answer any questions if I can help to clarify. It. I understand it's a difficult choice to make uh, uh, to to move forward into the era of LEDs. A lot of communities are grappling with this problem. So thank you for your time and uh, the opportunity to speak. Thank you, too. Appreciate it. Uh, if this does end for uh, December 4th is a cutoff, or December 3rd, whatever it is, uh, we do need to make a, a decision of whether we are going to or we're not going to. Uh, I, I went out there, walked it, and even when you look at these pictures here, light transfer is not that big. I mean, you're, you're looking at the 3,000 to 2,200 in the PC Amber. PC Amber, it, it, it really is. It's nothing. It's like a nightmare. Uh, well, let's just take a look at, and that's why I asked, I said, why wasn't somebody from public safety, why wasn't the terrorist from Environment Committee uh, out here when this was taking place? This would have been a great thing to be watching this happen. They said it was oh, it's the last minute thing, but and they, had a, they had to contact somebody who was going to be a last minute thing. But take a look. Take a look at your, you know, what is, you know, I don't want to be suspicious, but take a look at your 3,000 pay and how big that curb looks. Compared to where you're standing, and look how small the curb looks at a PC Amber, or even in between. It, does, was it closer to make it look brighter and then further back? Because those, those curves are not the same. If that person was standing, if you measured 10 feet from the curb, Every one of those pictures should have been 10 feet, but that curve on 3,000 K is really big compared to PCM. You know, the one thing we also have to take into consideration, I don't know if Chris can hear me, if he can't, I mean, he doesn't know. The proximity between light fixtures will also determine how much light pollution there is. And that is on the Dark Sky website, I just couldn't get to it quick enough. But there's a certain proximity. In my subdivision, they're a block or a block and a half, maybe two blocks between light fixtures. Here at the park, 75, 100 feet between light fixtures. And they're projecting a rectangular area of the street. There are other considerations that I think do not serve the 3000K justice in the conversation that we're having. Because if you have a light every mile, <laughs> or you have a light every 50 feet, it's going to make a difference in how much light pollution is coming out of the, those fixtures. These pictures are now light. They're very, uh, very projected. <clears throat> it's just my personal preference. The board can decide. No, I, that's a great point. And and you know, I I just like to clarify a few things. We aren't talking about street lights. We're talking about the street lights that we are going to put out there. Now, these are going to be the standard yes for developers coming in who are going to build new subdivisions and put in street lights or for commercial areas where they might put it into um, parking lots and things of that nature. Thank you. Um, but we are not, I, I, to Mr. Loonville's point, we are not changing our dark sky uh, initiative. We are trying to stick to it, as well as trying to stick to some combat uh, uh, programs. It, we are good fiscal stewards here. 
Why not try to capture money when we can? A standard is a standard. Whether or not you want to say, if you want to get cheeky and say that by, by meeting the minimum standard, we're not doing enough, I would say that, you know, the first and the last doctor walking out of, uh, of, of uh, med school are both called doctor. Um, you know, to, to, to establish a standard is a standard. So, you know, to say that, yes, you hit the standard, but you didn't hit it enough, I think is, is disingenuous. We are trying very, very diligently, I think, to, to try to be as true as we can to the, the initial, um, the, the reason for having the dark skies. So we are talking about just doing this on the, um, on the street lights. We are not talking about cracking open all the net lumens per acre, spillage, all of those other things that make my head spin, to be frank. Um, we are not talking about any of that. We are talking about a standard for the street lights. This ticks a lot of boxes. This goes beyond, you know, just the environment committee or public safety. This is everybody's thing. You know, this is going to affect everybody in the village. So, you know, th there has to be a lot, a lot more considered in this. I think. Um, so, th again, I, I point back to, and, and to Mr. Lubinbu's point about uh, he went on to IDA's website and can't find those documents. I was out there just yesterday and I was able to find several things that pointed to 3,000 being the uh, the standard. And yes, I saw the same exact information that he just mentioned. It is, at, you know, they say nothing above 3,000. These are 3,000. It does mention that there are other alternatives below 3,000, and I'm certainly aware of those, as we're aware of those looking at this, uh, our, our monitors right now. We know that there's a 2200 and these PC Amber LEDs. We know there's a bevy of other things. We know also, though, that we have the opportunity to take advantage of a ComEd program to both save energy in the long run and some money in the short term by using one that ticks the box that happens to tick both IDA's box as well as ComEd's box. So. My comment, Trustee Gray, is that you're not going to get a 25% bonus. The lady is in charge of this program. And she is not, not this year, but we will next year. Well, if you we will next year, and we do have to set a standard. We don't have to force an issue to that. But we do have to come up with some standards so that we can tell Lions Penner or Penner Lions what what fixtures we're going to go forward with as far as they're, they're going, them going out and servicing the, the the network of lights that we do have in town right now. Now you're right, the, the HPSs are not going to go away tomorrow. You know, uh, it'd be great if we can take advantage of this, uh, this opportunity with ComEd. Um, I really would like to see this thing come to a head, preferably tonight. Um, if that doesn't happen, we're going to have to get over this bridge. We have to establish a standard. Whether or not, you know, the ComEd saving money is the is the real push for it or not, uh, we are still going to have to establish a standard. Well, it does sound like there's a lot of resistance to it. I look at it this way. We already hit the standard. That's what uh, Dark Star Community was all about, is getting the light down. We got the light down. We we're the first one in the state of Illinois to be approved by it. And I, I look at it this way. No matter where you're at right now, something gets better every year. They're saying in a couple more years, they're, they're building cars that will fly right now in Florida. So they can get from Tampa to so-and-so in 45 minutes. Everything's changing. And if, if we're good where we're at, and we have an opportunity to save some money, and we have an opportunity to change some of the lights so everything in the, in the village is uniform, I think we go for it. And as for the 25%, if they lose the 25%, they're still getting $21,000. And we're getting something that's, that's unified. And, and like I said, you know, I've always, I, I agree with Trusty Bear. I like Dark Sky. I really do. But the older I get, the harder it is for me to see the streets. And I don't want to ask my wife all the time to drive because she drives like, she drives slow. <laughs> so I, I want to be able to get from A to B without, you know, when they were doing uh, 159th Street, there was one time I almost went off the road, but the car in front of me did, so I didn't. So it's just, you know, the, the darkness. I, I'm looking at these three, and when I took a walk around the park, and I saw the PC Amber, I understand, but to me, it's a big bug light. It, it, it doesn't really light up anything. It gives you... If you want to know from point A to point B what you're looking at, you can do it. And if for all these years we've had 3,000K, 
and we've got into what international dark sky wants, I say we don't fix something that's not broken. But it was a, not a 3,000K LED, which is a big difference. Well, but the dark sky approves it. So what happens, what happens right now if, if we, oh, we go, okay, let's go to the PCM, and in a year and a half they say, well, well we got a new one, and this one's much better. It's, it's, when does it stop? Well, I guess they're going to have to change out all of 159, because that's all high pressure sodium that they're going away so quickly. Well, it, that's why at 159th at that point, I think that's why yeah. we cut back on some of the lights, because we didn't want it. I'll bring it that the state wouldn't accommodate what we were looking for. So if we change it, we got a deal break down with ComEd, and sure, I really don't. If, if, if I walk this park or drive this park, and in a uh, corner of the property on the east side, and you start seeing all the, everything that's been put up there, and they've got the PCM in there, they've got the 2000K and the 3000, and, and they're all over our LED. There's not a night and day difference between the 3000 or 2200. It's a little bit darker for the 2200, but when I saw the PCM, and that was right next to a 3000, it, it it just didn't put off any light. And the picture that I'm looking at here, someone could be standing four feet behind that light pole. And the only reason I know it's a light pole there is because the science is lit up from the picture we had taken. We never even knew anybody who was there. Well, with the glare, you're going to get the same thing with a 3000 K LED. You didn't well, only, if, only if I look up at it. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to argue with you. I understand your passion for this, and, and I don't disagree with you. But right now, with what's going on and what comment is offering, and I think if we start doing this, you are going to lose a lot of people coming in here to want to build anything. Uh, and as for the housing end of it, I mean, it, it gets harder and harder for them, and, and it, it also makes, like Trustee Gray said, we're constantly changing our rules. If we had a rule, stick to it. If you don't stick to it, and you just keep changing, I don't know. Then we might as well borrow some more money and just go ahead and redo the lights. Yeah, can I get just one more point? And I'll leave this one. Um, I trust that you know, and I were just talking about the lighting, and I did not go to Pebble Creek. But if you look at Pebble Creek and you look at Twin Lakes where I live, there are, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but there are little darker communities in the sense that the darker grip, they were original subdivisions when Homer Glen was being built. You go to Cedar Brook, you put the PCM or the 2200 in front of these beautifully lit homes that are light in color, two-story. You know, it, it's a totally different perspective on how you're going to see the light. So, with new subdivisions coming up, even you know uh, uh, the new townhome subdivision, it, it, the, the architecture has changed, and the light is going to look different in those communities. In my in my subdivision, I'm not sure what I have. HPS or if I have the PC Amber, there's lights that are out in my subdivision. I don't even know they're out because it doesn't look like I have light in my subdivision. I only notice it when I drive by it 15 times and say, oh, that is actually not working. And I've called them in. So to me, it really, it's, you can't just base this on each subdivision, on a whole. You have to base, I mean, we have to base it on a whole, but it's going to look different every community. You're right. You're right. So, uh, and, and I agree with uh, Trustee Gray too. This is something that we just need to vote on the standard. Let's let's just yes or no is it's going to happen. And uh, this way, if it is, then at least I can get the papers out. Uh, they'll follow up on the rest of it. If we lose a 25, then we won't lose a 25, and that's our fault. Uh, but I would like. Uh, we already have the motions on it. I would like to have the. Wait, uh, Mayor, I'm sorry, Beth. Can you can you clarify what the motion is? Yeah, that's, you need to make a motion. Is it going to be All like right, is there a motion? Is there a motion accepting either 3,000K, 2,200K, or PC Amber LED? So, what we have to do right now is we have to get a consensus from the board of what they're looking for, and then we can actually vote on it. But the motion right now is to choose between the 3,000K, 2,200K, or the PC Amber LED. Okay. 
And I believe uh, Mr. DiCaprio actually did it in the motion of 2000. I don't know if it was second, though. Did it? It was second. Oh, yeah. No, it was trustee. No, it was trustee. It was second. No, second. Or trustee has me. Uh, trustee Caprio clarified that it was for 3,000. Right. And it was uh, Caprio for the for the motion and Pesmino for the second. So, so May I, I'm sorry. May I'm sorry. So is there a first and a second on the 3,000? Yes. Yes. There's a first. No, there's a first. Okay. There's a first and a second. The second was on the option of the 3,000. Yeah. So we, need a, we need a second. Okay. So. I'll second the 3,000. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've done discussion. So Madam Court, please call the roll. Trustee Gray. Aye. Trustee Backel? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Aye. Trustee Suisse? No. Trustee Caprio? Aye. Trustee Pasmino? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, next would be old business. Is there any old is there any old business? Is there any new business? All right, the next item would be executive session. Is there a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing purchase or sale of real property, potential, and pending litigation? I motion. Trustee Bickle, I'll second. Trustee Caprio, 